My name is Rainer Kattel. I'm a deputy director at IIPP and also a professor for innovation and public governance. And I'm also a acting, uh, act, acting head of teaching uh, because our um, head of teaching, uh, Kate Roll, just went to maternity leave. So um, congratulations to her. I think um, she, I'm sure she will watch this recording in, in future years. And uh, so this is a nice way to say hello from, from the past. So we are recording this event as well. So um, uh, just for uh, future purposes and chatting with people, obviously, who might not be able to join it because they are sleeping or working or or all of those things are, are taking care of their uh, children or dogs or, or whatever that might be. Uh, so yeah, we, we have a um, webinar, uh, which is about our uh, master's in public administration. The, public administration, um, the master's is um, in the area of innovation, public value and public policy. So it has a quite a, a mouthy title, but uh, but really the focus uh, and the catchwords around uh, uh, masters are, are here on the screen, you can see it is uh, one of our slogans we use very often, which is innovation is political. And we we think that uh, societies really have to co-create and uh, co-shape the, the way innovation is, uh, is in turn shaping our societies. So when we think about renewable energy or when we think about uh, digital infrastructure or AI, so this is not only that the market actors are, are shaping the way innovation uh, is is uh, is taking place, but also public actors and also, of course, uh, social actors as well. So this is what the MPA is is really very much about: is how can we shape the futures of our society? And hence the slogan "Innovation is Political." So joining me here today are um, two students: one former, one current, and uh, another faculty member. And uh, so we um, we have David Eves, who was an associate professor in digital government and also a co-deputy director with me. And he will uh, talk later on about our um, sort of like future plans around the MPA, particularly focusing on how do we think about creating some specializations and pathways uh, within the MPA. But uh, before that, we um, we thought we'll, rather than having faculty members talk about the program that they're teaching, we, we actually have students uh, speak. So first of all, I will, give the floor to a one of the alumna, uh, Anjum, uh, who graduated or, or was part of the last year's cohort. And uh, she will tell us about um, her experiences and um, why she joined this MPA and, and what she took away, I guess. So Anjum, floor is yours. Thank you, Lina. And I think all the things that you were saying almost uh, encapsulated what I wanted to say that why I joined the MPA. <laughs> Um, so I'm Anjum. I'm from India. And as you can see, I'm from the 22-23 uh, batch at IPP. And uh, my first degree was actually in engineering and economics. And my first job was actually in investment banking, designing digital products for financial regulations. Um, but right after that, I moved towards the public sector, recognizing that government is actually the biggest change maker. And I worked with the uh, with the highest offices of government of India working in urban sustainability, working in monitoring and evaluation of an organization called Niti Aayog, which used to be the planning commission of India. And right before coming, I also consulted governments in Middle East and Asia on digital government. Um, but looking at the reason why I wanted, why I really wanted to work in the government is that the, the change making function to say, and the more I worked in the government and with the governments, I realized that it's the change making capability which at that time called the innovation capacity in some sense. And now I call it dynamic capabilities, having studied at IPP, uh, is something which I found is not very naturally existing in those spaces. So how do I really create that space within the governments to have that cap capability is what really attracted me to IPP. And that time I was looking at this intersection of innovation and public administration. And I actually did not find any other masters which was focusing on that. And IIPP was the only place with a, with a sharp focus on that. And that's why I really joined IIPP. And uh, my reason was more so much to get that vocabulary to speak about what I'm, con what I'm trying to say, to get that community of people who are also working on similar topics and who are also trying to explore similar pathways. And to say the least, I think I got all of that. 
And um, and there's one thing I think we speak about at IPP on how the course content is created, which is like there's an element of theory, practice, application, all of that combined. And that really gives you the vocabulary. And if you move on to the next screen, um, um, the right after. So it's also about like not just what IIPP does, but also how IIPP does is something I received at uh, at the MPA. Um, so this is something I want to convey, like what really a classroom at IIPP could look like. The first, the one you see on the left most is actually a classroom, uh, is actually one of David's class. It's a spoiler alert, I should have said. Um, and uh, this is one of the classes. Um, uh, so this is this is how basically I want to convey that there are a lot of group activities and that we engage in. It's not always like a teacher classroom connection that we are trying to establish in, in the classes. The second one that you actually see is actually from Liner's course where we are conducting a class in the community. So we went to Peckham Levels and there's a community uh, organization with which we worked and we had other community members and we were co-creating outcomes with them and that was a class for us. The last one that you see is actually a teach out where we went for a walk and a tour of design museum and the, uh, and the teacher you see is the one who teaches the design course. So it's just to say the different flavors of IIPP and that you experience as a student. And if you move on to next slide, I also want to say that it's not that the learning was always something which the Institute is delivering to you based on whatever is pre structure. There were enough opportunities to co-create that learning opportunity. Uh, so there was a lot of self-organized learning that our batch did. And I'm sure Wallace will also talk about the opportunities that they are creating. So the first one that you see on the left is this initiative that some of us came up with called IIPP in the wild, where we tried to test like what exactly does it look like when these IIPP ideas actually go out in the world? What are the challenges you face and how people are actually maneuvering it? The one you see on the right most is actually an initiative called Human Libraries, which is again entirely student driven, where we, we said that we don't only want to learn from the curriculum, we also want to learn from the people that we are working with, that we are studying with. And that became like kind of a sharing space where you learn from life journeys and work experiences and everything. I'm sure and I think that's also another initiative which has been continued by the next cohort. And what you see in between is actually something which was a again, a collaboration between the Institute and the students where we created a self-led, uh, a student-led exhibition of some of the class assignments and how some of those actually spoke to the practice. So this is actually a gathering which happens every year and it's the gathering of all the mission-oriented uh, organizations that IIPP works with. And this is where some of the students went ahead and portrayed some of their, um, their projects. So that's on the learning part. And I think the other part, if you move on to the next slide, is also the, I think, um, it is an international program. And that's something we also wanted to speak about, like how there's a big international community that you become part of. And that's, I, I think that's not, and you get all the elements of like, you know, the diverse culture that you interact with, the diverse interests of people that you interact with. But at the same time, I feel that the learning that, is enriched because of being an international group and the way it is such a practitioner-led program that you get to hear from people's and people's experiences and that enriches your learning journey as well. But also this community I felt at IIPP was not just uh, limited to students, but also there was a fair bit of community that you feel with the teaching staff, with the non-teaching staff. If I have a question, I can go to David and Reiner and you know ask about my next career step, for example. And um, so that community, I felt, was something very strong uh, at IIPP. And, and that was also uh, reflective. That was also reflected on what I actually did right after the MPA. So right after the MPA, I, I worked with David for a while to research on a particular topic of digital public infrastructure, which came out of uh, the small reading group that we were running throughout the year. And, um, and we shaped this project to identify what is the missing gap of this repository that we wanted to build of the DPI deployments across the globe. And starting from that small idea, we actually made it into something where now we have a repository uh, of DPI deployments across 100 plus countries. And I'm sure David would have more thoughts about it and there are many more student projects that he's running this year and from the previous years that he can talk about. Um, and yeah, and now what I'm doing is I'm actually working with another mission-oriented organization in London, 
uh, another organization that IPP works very closely with, which is the Camden Council. And I'm a policy and insight officer there. And um, um, yeah, and I think, um, and that's again a continuation of what we learned at IPP. We, we learned missions at IPP and what I'm doing there is evaluating the missions. And um, and and the other and what I see my other fellow MPs uh, doing is also in many other mission oriented organizations. I know people who are working at cabinet office, people who are working in Venova, people who are working in the governments of their own countries in France, Indonesia, Singapore. Some of the examples I just remember on top of my head. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's pretty much my experience. And I'm sure that this doesn't cover all the different experiences that people have, uh, but just to give you a slight insight into this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Anjum. And uh, yeah, the one thing I forgot to, and, um, and Dana put it in, in the chat. So if you have any questions about the NPA, about uh, program, um, student life, um, any question that we as faculty can answer or, or students can answer, just po post them in the, in the Q&A function and uh, even as, as others are speaking I can I can maybe answer them in writing or if not we can we can answer them in, in person online as well and yeah I don't know David whether you want to comment on this um, student engagement in, in research projects because this is something that I think we talk about a lot and but it's always of course dependent on what research projects are, are ongoing at the moment and I think um, Anjum was involved in your in your research so maybe I you could say like a few words about that you know, one of the things I always tell students, um, particularly in like a one-year program like ours, is um, it's always nice when you come in and you have uh, some strong ideas about what you want to be doing next. And when you do have that idea, to go and find a faculty member, be it within the IPP or even actually across UCL, who's engaged in that area, and just go find a way to be useful to them. And, you know, they, you know, they will find ways, if you are useful, they'll find ways to engage you in their work. And, um, you know, Anjum and I just ended up having a few conversations, like some more conversations. And then I, you know, I asked her if she could do something for me and she did, and she did a great job. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Let's do some of this other thing. And, and pretty soon I kind of like snowballed into us scoping out this project um, that, you know, in the early days, we were just kind of doing off a little bit off the side of our desk, but now it's turned into a giant research funded project that I think I mentioned in the comment is really creating a data set that a whole large number of like multinationals and NGOs and governments around the world are looking at to help them understand what's happening in the digital government space. Um, and so you kind of, if you are willing to, if you're willing to engage with faculty, there's real opportunities for those things to turn into substantive research projects that are interesting, not just because of the research they generate, but because the value they can create to a much larger ecosystem because the IPP is so engaged in in the kind of work of the real world. Yeah, thank thank you so much, David. And uh, and yeah, even uh, I think we we have a and um, by now, of course, we have a really active alumni community as well. So whenever I think we have research projects, we always now know the turn to alumni because uh, in many ways they are the they are the best resource um, because they know us and um, and they know us our ways of working. They know our ideas. They um, they very often have had a really, really good experience, so they're very keen to be involved as well. And so I think our building by now is kind of full of uh, ex-students, either working here as a full time or part time, or and so that's I think is a is a wonderful um, um, uh, way of showing um, that the community is really, really working well. And uh, but let let's go to uh, Wallace, um, who's a current student uh, from current cohort, so. You took uh, time from your busy um, teaching, I'm not teaching, study, and uh, yeah, have a, have a, yeah, floor, please. Great. Kia ora koutou. I'm Wallace. I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I moved to the UK about June last year, which was a very clever tactic to avoid a double winter for those of you who are joining from the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and prior to starting the MPA, I was a civil servant in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So I was working across a range of different climate policy issues, um, spanning environmental reform, sustainable food system, sustainable finance. And previous to that, I, um, I completed two undergraduate degrees. This is all the boring stuff first. Two undergraduate degrees, one in marine biology, climate biodiversity, and another in, in management with some economics sprinkled in. 
but really people come from all across all across the sphere to get here. My particular research interest at the moment is in financing the, the just transition and what this means in terms of sort of redefining the relationship between the state and private finance. And happily, this is something I've been able to focus on throughout the MPA in various assignments and have amazing, really deep conversations with faculty throughout that process as well. But I think you're all here because you want to know what it looks like to be part of the IIPP. So let me paint you a picture. It's the end of September 2024. You arrive in London. It's just turning to autumn. The leaves are falling and you're totally alone. Into week one, you're lost. There are way too many new humans around you. And to be quite frank, they all seem cooler and cleverer than you. Maybe like many of my friends, you also only understand sort of 60% of what all of these British weirdos are talking about. And you worry that you're just not going to be able to do it. But week two, the social events begin, you meet Mariana, you find your cheapest local pub, and you decide you're going to make friends with at least three people. Week three, things speed up, the learning deepens, and all of a sudden you remember why you came here. You're already best friends with at least 15 people in the cohort, and you're sending way too many academic papers to your previous colleagues. It's kind of embarrassing. Fast forward to week six and you're already on a reading week holiday with like 15 different people who six weeks ago were strangers. And by week 10, you've submitted some brilliant papers. You've learned so much. You know all of the faculty. The IAPP kitchen is basically home and you're sad to have to spend Christmas without your new colleagues, to be honest. So you can read all about the courses online and Anjum's done a really good job at articulating and visualizing what some of these courses can look like. But I really want to focus on the community that you build in the process of the MPA. And one of the really interesting things about the IPP as a new organization is that the faculty are really open to an experimental approach. In fact, it's kind of core to how the IPP operates. So this is kind of the unique part of the MPA is that you are co-creating it while you're doing it. So, for example, I'm also the careers and alumni representative for the student cohort this year, which means that I've been doing lots of work to kind of create structures that connect us better to alumni and to future career opportunities. So at the moment, I'm working with a previous alumni to co-create a mentorship program going forward. And like Reiner said, this idea of kind of an alumni community is really important to the IAPP. And Anjum also talked about this other kind of co-creation of the human libraries, which is effectively a space in which uh, different students can present on their life, on their kind of journey to get to this point. And it's a really quite a special thing that's been created and has stayed as a legacy for, for several years now. So I'm currently in term two of as David said, a very short one year program. So you really have to try and get as much out of it as you can. And we're at this pivot point of choosing between writing a thesis or going into a placement organization with a mission oriented um, organization. So this is another quite unique aspect of the IPP. And it really embodies the, the vision and the commitment to bring the theory alive through practice-based learning, this idea of having, um, having a placement option. So this is kind of one of the key points of the year when students have to make this decision between the two pathways. And I've also been asked to talk about my career prospects, but I'm going to shirk that responsibility a little bit and instead talk about just how many people chose to come to this to this program to to do a career pivot because I actually think that that better reflects many in my cohort this year who don't necessarily know exactly what they want to get out of it or exactly who they want to be when they finish the program so we've got lawyers consultants doctors civil servants community leaders digital geniuses founders and CEOs and almost all of us came to the IPP for this opportunity to rethink where we've been and think further about where we go. So all that to say, you don't need to know exactly who you want to be a year from now. You just have to know that you want to go on this journey of learning. And the other thing that Anjum talked about a little bit is the various opportunities to get involved with research projects throughout the program. So right now I'm working with Rhino on a project with the Food and Agriculture Organization, looking at building capabilities for food systems transformation, which is really interesting and gives me great insight into the work, not only that the IPP are doing, 
but that other organizations that have this mission focused are doing around the world. So I'm not just saying this because David and Reiner are here, but I do have to admit that, um, you know, on camera recorded, very earnest, that this has been one of the most enriching kind of experiences of my, of my life. And they're just very, the inclusive, diverse and challenging purpose-led community of the IPP is what I have seen as, as the biggest value from this year. The learning itself is amazing, but the community is something that is lifelong. And if you just want to go to the next screen, thank you. I just wanted to include this to kind of support my idea of community and alumni connection and meeting new people who really enrich, enrich your learning and your thinking. So a bit about this picture. This is from a few weeks ago when we um, collectively organized and rented a 17th century manor on the Isle of Wight in the south of England for 20 people. So quite a big project in organizing it actually. David helpfully gave us some games. So we had connection with one of the faculty members who lives on the island. Um, it was an opportunity to read, write, hike, talk politics and have, have dinner and connect more. So it's not really somewhere I expected myself to be a year ago with all of these relatively new people in my life, but I'm very glad that I have ended up here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, sorry for um, being interrupted here, but this is a life in IFPP. So there is a, somebody is doing a security sweep because a minister is coming to visit us tomorrow. So I won't mention which country uh, <laughs> because it never is recorded. Never know when it goes out. But uh, yeah, this is part of, I think, our our uh, our identity as well. We work a lot with uh, various policymakers. And uh, and so there, there's all, you know, every week there's probably somebody from a really interesting organization coming to visit us and uh, yeah and um, and so this is part of part of our life so i've been um, answering questions uh, in the chat um i think now before i open the floor to everybody to have your questions i think david maybe you want to speak a bit, bit about this i our our emerging thinking around mpa pathways and why do we think it's important and and of course the, the next cohort you will be part of that, testing it out, figuring it out, what does it mean? So as you heard from Anjum and, and, and Wallace, we are very keen to engage with students to experiment around our program itself. So yeah, maybe just a few words. Maybe. Thank you so much, Reiner. Um, one, it's great to see that photo of the dinner um, out on the Isle of Wight. That looks like a lot of fun and um, thrilled to hear that uh, people were playing games and having a good time. Um, and I would just echo Reiner's point as well and like the you know, one of the things that you want to be looking at when you're thinking about an MPA program is just, is it connected to the types of practices and the types of ideas that you are interested in? Um, and so I think one of the strengths of the IPP is the faculty here are, are engaged in research and rigorous research, but also many are very engaged with practitioners in thinking about, you know, helping them advance the ideas about how they're trying to make their organization perform more effectively and impact and help their citizens more effectively. And so even within my own class, so for example, like last year, we had the Greek digital minister who I've had the chance of working with over the past several years, multiple times come and talk about how he was doing, he was transforming the Greek government, which has made huge strides in the last few years. And, and then have a personal conversation with me about, you know, how we work together and, and, you know, how the ideas that I'm teaching in my class and to my students, I worked with him on and he's now implementing them. And so there is this real connection to practice that I kind of want to, to emphasize in that result. And, and because of the connection the faculty have with the practitioners, they're passing through all the time. And I think that makes for a great environment. And I think you want to be looking at schools that do that in the domains that you're particularly interested in. And so one of the things that, you know, we've been focused on at the IPP is I think there's like, I kind of think of us as a, as kind of like a, uh, a yin yang symbol where there's really two core pieces that come together that I think make the IPP particularly special. And so one is the notion of kind of really rethinking value and rethinking the economy. Like how do we reimagine what economics looks like and how the and, and how the world understands value and uses that to shape all the decisions that, that are being made every single day. So that's kind of one half of the equation. And on the other half of the, case, on, of the equation is really this notion of 
how do you rethink what the role and the function of the state is in this new world? So in a in a world where for the next 70 years, we really are going to be, there's going to be huge and incredible opportunities, but some real crises in front of us. Um, we're dealing with, you know, the real, the kind of, we're now kind of like really reading an inflection point around um, the adoption of digital technologies, uh, a huge inflection point around the climate crisis. Um, as, as more of these crises are confronting us, what is the role of the state and how should we reimagine that? And here I think like the faculty of real strength in both these domains and it's the kind of the union of those that I think makes the IPP special. So on the kind of one side, I kind of think of Reiner and I, particularly and Kate as like the state capacity where people really trying to push the boundaries of that. And then Mariana and Josh and Caroline, um, uh, they're all thinking really, they're all thinking really hard about how we reimagine value. So to capitalize on that, one thing we've been thinking about is not just to have our kind of MPA program, but to allow the students to actually um, choose to do kind of a subspecialty in one of those two areas. So one would be you could, you could choose to elect to do more courses in a digital government uh, in the digital government vein, and if you, you know, for example, do your final project or your thesis on a digital government topic, and you take a certain number of electives, you'd emerge with a certificate, not just with your MPA degree, but a certificate in digital government. And conversely, you could also choose to do your final project on um, a topic that's more focused on, uh, you know, rethinking, uh, rethinking value, um, and take some of those electives, and then you could emerge with a certificate of that. This is a way to give students an opportunity to go deeper in some of these domains and to kind of show the world, this is where I'm trying to position myself and this is where I'm trying to, to shape my skills and my knowledge to go and, and affect change in the organizations I'm gonna go and join after I leave the ITP. That's a little bit of where we're going. Yes, thank you so much. And there was also a, uh, a question about the cohort size. So just to put it out there for everybody as well, at the last year's cohorts, I think they both have been around 73, 75 uh, students. But we have a quite a number of uh, part-time students, um, and maybe like ten or so, around ten, twelve. So I think that even more, yeah. So uh, which means that um, these are the students who stick around longer. So which is great because they pro provide some continuity, which is which is really nice because they can be also like good, um, you know, buddies and peers for the new students. They can, you know, particularly because we are part of a big. Uh, you know, world-class university UCL did, uh, with its own bureaucracy. So it might sometimes take time to get to know how to, you know, where things are, how to get them quicker, you know, and the people have all, everybody has some unique circumstances. So having these, you know, part-time students who have, you know, seen it all, done it all, it, it's very good. Uh, and also, of course, because they tend to be local. So I think that's a really nice way as well of, um, of, uh, of helping people to settle in and finding the cheapest pub as uh, as, uh, as Wallace was saying and and things like that which which is really important I just wanted one more thing uh, because yeah we still have a couple more days to go um, in order for you to apply for our own scholarship so there is I, I know um, some of the students are coming with their own country scholarships uh, where, and various other ways of uh, there's lots of uh, Germanian students among our our um, uh, students, for instance, and, and so on. But we also have our our own, what we call a policy studio scholarship. So this is available for, for everybody. Everybody can apply for it. We're, but we are looking for students who, who might have a perhaps a bit more sort of research and policy experience, uh, policy analytical experience, for instance, so that they could be engaged in in the, in the policy projects from, from day one. But I think what we have learned is actually all of our, all of our students so far have a really good background in that. So I highly recommend that um, if you're interested in that uh, scholarship, you can still apply, I think, by the end of this week, Thursday. So it's um, end of this month. And of course, as you, as you know, the MPA deadline is, uh, is is longer until the end of March, I think. And for the UK students, it's even, even longer than that. Uh, I think the UK students can apply until August, if I'm not mistaken, I'm like really well prepared, as you might see, for this <laughs> deadlines. But but I'm sure people, uh, Dana and others, can can help me with the with the deadlines and a bit of an academic cliche here. But um, uh, so there is, uh, yeah, David. Yeah, Reiner, can I add some color to some of the questions that I think have been asked in the? Go ahead. Um, so one person asked, like, what the, you know, how many students in a cohort, and you know, I think our kind of. Our, we're, we're currently hovering around 75. And, and one of the things just to kind of follow up on Wallace's 
point is like, just to kind of paint a picture of that, you know, the cohorts are incredibly international. So I, I don't think of the 75, I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Wallace or Anton, but I would say kind of about 15 or maybe from the UK, kind of ballpark around there, but maybe even less. It's kind of sometimes tricky because some of our students like are Italians, but they've been living in London for two years, but they're really, they're still Italian. So it's like, you know, what do they, like, what do they identify as? But, but kind of, and then there's a, I would say very strong representation from particularly Latin America, but, um, but also from India um, and also from Asia so and, and North America. And, and then, a, and then maybe slightly more from Europe, like from the continent of Europe than maybe anywhere else. But even there, you can see and kind of has, so even as we have this conversation, you can get a, a real sense of the diversity. So one nice thing with the student body is you're getting in the classroom, you're getting a very international perspective of how the problems are being talked about. And people are viewing these problems through their own national lenses and then bringing those lenses into the classroom. And so they're, you're going you're gonna to understand these issues, not from a kind of necessarily UK basis, or I'm a Canadian, for example, and I'm teaching, I'm faculty, or from a Canadian basis, but really from a quite kind of international perspective of how lots of different people are tackling them. So I think that's like one picture I really want to kind of paint about the cohort. And then um, there was another question, which was like, uh, the difference between studying full-time versus part-time. I would say like one real advantage of our program is that it is a single year. And so the opportunity cost versus kind of the benefit of our program is very, very high. Like the, the financial cost to you and the time cost to you is relatively short. Um, and that, that there are real advantages to that, but as Wallace had mentioned, it, it does go by quickly. Like you do fly through the program, so you you want to use that time well. Um, the flip side of that is like the, the kind of the people who are part-time, the advantage there is, as, as, as Reiner mentioned, they get to stay in their work that can make it financially more affordable for them. They do typically have to be based in the UK they maybe miss out a little bit more on the kind of social aspect because they don't, they're not quite as embedded in the cohort in the same way as the people who are there for a full year, but they also get to see and meet more people across two years. So there's real kind of trade-offs and benefits both ways, but it kind of gives you a picture of, of that experience. And then someone's also asked kind of like how much experience you typically have in order to apply into the program. And Reiner kind of responded like three years is typical. And I think that's about right. We I think we have I think we have a handful one or two students who came straight out of undergrad this year, so it's not that that's outside the realm of the possible. It's just less common, and I would say that I think people really feel like they benefit from the program having had lived experience that they can bring into the classroom and share with their peers. So like even today we were running a class and so much of the class um, was was informed by the personal experiences of the people in the seminar and, and what they had done when they were in government or working in an organization. And so I think it's easier for you to engage the material if you've had a few years of experience um, in the in the workforce. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I don't know whether, whether Andrew and, and, or, or Wallace, you want to speak to Charlotte's question about um, what's the, I know you both of you are full-time or work with some students, but, but looking at your, your, your peers, what do you think was their sort of time commitment going through a, like a typical week? I think, um, um, so So I think it's, it's also dependent on how the coursework is divided. So I think just to get an idea, it's like we do four courses as a full-time student in a term and as a part-time student, you're doing two courses in a term. So it's just like, I think in very technically, theoretically looking, it's half the time that you're spending. But also I think, the experience of doing it part-time also means that you engage more deeply with the content. So it varies across people, like depending on their work commitments, how much time do they give? But essentially I would understand that it's half of what a full-time student undergoes. Um, yeah, I don't know what you really want to add to that, but. I think from, from my discussions with others doing the course part-time, the key challenge is compartmentalization. And so most of the people I know have kind of split their week in half, but they have to be incredibly rigid about when they're in university mode and when they're in work mode. So I think just being really practical and pragmatic about how you separate those two things is critical. And then like Reiner said, you've got this amazing luxury of being able to continuously apply the learning to your work context, which I think does deepen it in a lot of ways. Yeah, and and, and um, 
we by now, you know, partially because of COVID, partially because of the possibilities, you know, everybody has, it's easy to record things. So we, we quite regularly record, um, you know, the events or, or talks we have. And, you know, I think in, in all of the courses and modules, we offer what we call like enrichment and brown bag lectures, which are like not mandatory part of the course, but and um, so I do, for instance, um, this this uh, term I teach. So I have every every week there is like a a brown bag session. Student, you know, they bring their lunch. There is somebody talking, somebody from practice or academic talking about their their work. But we record it as well. So even if you're not able to, and and we have some part-time students who can't come to those events, but they're still recording. So you can still, um, you know, there's flexibility around how much you can can still um, um, consume of the content. Um, yeah, this there's question saying, about like this, this question about like, do you need to have governing experience to benefit to kind of realize the full benefit of the course? And I'd actually love to hear, you know, while you came out of government and Angie, you've done a little bit of both. I'd love to hear your answers first before before Reiner and I chimed in. So, while if you want, as someone who has government experience, what are you observing of people who don't, and do you think they're do you think you're like you have an unfair advantage or you're you're extracting more? I'm curious. Yeah, and I think I responded in the chat as well, just that this year we have a weirdly perfect breakdown of kind of 25% academia, 25% third sector, 25% private, 25% public. So I don't know. I feel like that that graph was definitely gamed by someone, but anyway, it's very nice. Um, in terms of the experience throughout the MPA, I actually think that each course plays on quite different strengths. So for example, we had a policy writing course last year, which David led. And that was really interesting, in fact, because it wasn't just approached in terms of a public policy lens. It was also thinking about private policy. So I, I think that, in fact, you're in a position where if you're coming from a public sector lens, you get the opportunity to apply a private sector onto that. But if you're coming from a private sector lens, many of our consultants say have sat on the other side of much of that strategy work. And so then they're able to kind of see it from the from the other lens. So I think generally that if you bring any experience, you can kind of bring it in because it's so transdisciplinary in nature, the actual course. So I definitely don't think that there's a disadvantage in not coming from government. And like I spoke about earlier, so many of my colleagues are here for that pivot. So it really presents the opportunity in seminar time, in class time, to actually understand from so many different contexts around the world where people have worked in government or private sector or third sector or academia and share those experiences. Yeah, exactly. So we, um, as, as I put it in the chat as well, we, uh, we really value the diversity of backgrounds as well because, you know, you know, thinking about innovation is political, so it's not about only government officials and politicians and uh, directing innovation, but it's also working together with, with businesses, with social entrepreneurs and uh, multinational, multilateral organizations, all that. So that's, that's really important to, to have that diversity for us. So yeah, if you have any, any other questions, there's, oh, there's one more. And um, at the moment we have only one scholarship from the studio. So unfortunately that's uh, very, lim very limited opportunity um yeah so okay, you can post those questions or keep them coming if and and of course also if you if you want to ask um Anjum or, or Wallace something privately I'm sure they're they're happy to um respond to your email as well so um, um you know if, if it it can also be more technical because again depending on your background the application process might be um, something that you you might just want to hear how it was. And I think one of my one of my questions, actually, both to you, Anjum and, and Wallace, is um, you know if you if you think back, you know the way you applied or the way you make the, the decision to come here, what would you do differently in terms of uh, uh, is there anything just to give like advice? How do you make this decision? How do you you know all of those because you you were working before you have plans afterwards. So what was what went into your decision making process? Perhaps might be what helped you make this decision. Let's let's put it like that. I think I spoke a little bit about like why I chose the MPA and it very much related to what I was looking at at that point. Like what kind of exploration I wanted at that point. 
but my only suggestion in general is that decide early. Like I remember it was almost the day of the deadline when I was speaking to Zainer and, you know, figuring out my questions. Um, so I think just plan early because there's so many things that you will be going through. Like you'll be deciding to leave your job. You'll be deciding to leave your city, country, home maybe. And so there's a lot of that logistical constraint that you are you have to fight through and just clear out that so you have better energy when you start the program um so that is like one of my uh advice in general but i i would love to know wallace what was your uh experience and how did you decide to come well that's very nice contrast because i'm like an uber planner so i think i applied the day that it opened i found out like two weeks later i was like cool now what do i do for the next nine months um, so I actually was so prepared that it meant that I could pivot into a new role within my organization that was looking at sustainable finance specifically so that I could then use my thesis on this. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's going to really be the case for everyone, but if you do kind of plan that far in advance, you do have a lot of scope to then think about actually what is the thread that I want to pull throughout this MPA. And obviously there's many different ways to approach it. But um, as I said, like my particular interest is in kind of financing the climate transition. So with, with that advanced knowledge, I was able to then make sure that I focused all of my kind of assignments on it throughout it. Um, and I guess that the advice that I would have given myself at that point in time was just to be really even more granular about what I wanted to, what I wanted to get out of it and what I wanted to, to put into it throughout that process. Yeah, thank, thank you. And I think that, that tends to be, you know, what we, from a faculty perspective, what we experience is that our students tend to be, you know, even if they don't have like a plan, what they want to do afterwards, I think they are in term, in, in a sense, like quite demanding because they, it, it's either like they want to do something next in the career, they want to pivot in the career. So there's quite, quite a, I would say a high level of ex ex expectations, which probably is is typical for a postgraduate degree, but I think in, in our case that tends to be particularly heightened because it's a, it's a, it's a relatively unique degree and it is focus and it's it's diversity, it's mixture of economics and public sector and the state and and so there is a I think there is a really interesting mixture of expectations and and hence I think from the faculty perspective as well, I think we we are always sort of thinking about you know what do we use in teaching materials, how do we you know shape the seminars so there is lots of weaving uh, and of different experiences and then figuring out a way how can we help um, you know every, you know as many students as possible in their next steps as well and and that's i think where, where for instance then the work that well as you have been leading on uh, around the alumni community as well will be very important have having this community of people who can have you come through some of this already and uh, and can help you with, with these questions as well i think there is a very specific question from 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 Kai Wenger, and um, so about uh, personal uh, statement. Yeah, I think the, um, there are there. Are, yeah, I think most personal statements actually are longer than than five hundred words, which is essentially a one page. I think you get two two and a half three pages, which is really a good amount. And what we look for, you know, personal statement is really the motivation for for coming here and. Uh, and in many ways, that's probably the most important um, document because that's where you really are are explaining why why do you want to come here? And it's it's not only interesting for us to see in terms of admissions, but it's also you know generating this image of who's coming and why they are coming, and also in, in terms of expectations and and we can start to mentally prepare some of the things that we are um, talking to you from from induction week onwards. So that's uh, that's important. So, but yeah, don't be wor don't worry really about the word limit in that sense. Nobody's looking at that. Yeah, I was my students, both and Jim and Wallace will know this. Even with my assignments, I tell students, you know, if, if you submit a haiku that is transcendental and really exposed, tells us exactly who you are and what you're about, um, that's okay. And if you write ten thousand words, that's okay too. But if I, you make me read ten thousand words, it better really be worth it. So, uh, you know, it's really about communicating what you're about. Um, and doing it well, I think that's the most important. Thing. You're you're telling us a lot in that statement about who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Um, Reiner, maybe like one question I want to say is like the the, the like I'm all maybe one thing this is about the cohort. One thing I'd say is the thing I really noticed with the cohort here is how change oriented they are. So 
the students who come to IPP really are, they're interested in driving change. Um, there's fewer people here who are kind of like careerists, who are kind of like, yeah, I want to have a job in government. And like, you know, this is kind of a way for me to like get my foot up the next rung of the ladder and just get that promotion. But that's, it's not that people are not interested in that, but they really are here. There's like, there's a real hunger to learn and figure out how to like change institutions and do things differently. And so I think that actually adds to the, the students add a lot of energy to the place. And the quality of the students is quite high. And so I think there is like an academic rigor that there's an expectation around that people have when they come here. Um, but there's also an openness and a recognition that, you know, by the time you come to the IPP, your previous academic career might be quite far behind you and may not be reflective of where you're at. So Reiner, it might be interesting to talk a little bit about like, how, like what, what are the expectations for people who are applying kind of academically and how do they demonstrate, how, how can they demonstrate that? And, and if they've had maybe a weaker academic, we have accepted some people who have weaker academic tasks, but have been able to demonstrate other things. How, how, what have we looked for in those applicants? Yeah, I think then, you know, it's, it's all comes down to your experience. So it doesn't have to be experience in, in private sector. Maybe you have worked at an NGO and, and that NGO has, uh, you can you can show that this, this work is really, really interesting out in our context around innovation and public value and government capacity and things like that. So that's very often then the case then that, that people, even if they are not fully meeting the academic requirement, we can uh, still offer them the place because we are still, you know, we find your background interesting. We find what you bring to the to the course uh, really, really interesting. So yeah, so it's both. Um, yeah, I would I would very much say that the academic level is 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 more almost like a formality in many ways. It's it's much more about your what you have done with your with your life in terms of where have you worked, what are what are you interested in, and where you want to go next. That sort of like a journey in some ways is, is what's what's really important. Yeah, that experience is is what you find is 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 really key. But again, this experience can be at the consultancy firm, and then you you have to tell us why do you want to move on from that or go back to consultancy. That's also fine, because these are really interesting perspectives that that we value very highly. Um, uh, I think Wallace, you want to take the Romberg's question. Yeah, and I actually thought it might be nice for Anjum to speak a little bit more about her placement options. So I'm choosing a thesis, so I'm not particularly useful there, but I will quickly talk about this brown bag session that most of the courses are incorporating, which means that we do get access to some quite exceptional um, leaders across various across various sectors. Um, and so engaging with those professionals at that level is very easy. I think it's also helpful from a, um, from a practical experience that all of our professors are really blending the theory with the practice in a lot of their research. And a lot of them are kind of this sort of seemingly made up category, David, of visiting practice professor person. Um, and I think that's quite unique actually in a university setting. And it's kind of like a, a way to sidestep the sort of academic siloing of what it means to become this traditional professor. So I think that there's a lot of access to people who are doing real work and who are bringing the theory into reality through various mechanisms. But maybe, Andrew, it would be useful to speak a little bit more about your placement. Yeah, I am actually also not the right person because I didn't do placement as well. <laughs> but I think just to touch upon that, that there are these placements that you do in term three, where you work with an organization which is doing the mission-oriented approach, and you actually embed in that organization for six weeks and apply some of the learning that you have been learning for the last two terms. And I know my batchmates were working, like somebody was working in OECD, people were working in local councils and hacking Westminster. Um, and yeah, so there were a bunch of uh, different organizations that I think maybe Diana and David know more about the um, organizations. But I actually did my thesis, which was under Dino, and I was trying to evaluate innovation labs. So again, the topic was very practice oriented. And for that thesis, I engaged with a lot of practitioners within the IPP network and beyond. Um, so I think there is definitely that opportunity of engaging with the practitioners that IPP already engages with. And just the just the orientation of the research and the way 
uh, Rainer guided me was so much oriented towards how we can make it useful for practice. So there is definitely a lot of engagement that happens. I think the other opportunity that I was speaking about was this um, uh, the poster session we did with Mission Oriented Innovation Network Gathering. So where again, it's essentially a network of uh, practitioners where we were able to create the space to for students to come and interact with uh, with the practitioners so there are those opportunities i think which are created but also like there's so much opportunity to for to explore that within the ipb ecosystem uh, i know david or Diana, you want to speak about the placement yeah just just very quickly i think that we yeah in general um you know, Camden, where you now work, uh, Anjum is has been uh, one of our placement organizations for years, and is of course Camden Council because we are physically situated in Camden Council in London, uh, or anyway a very close partner for us. But it, yeah, it's it's a good example. So I think at the moment you and and one of one other alumni actually works at Camden. So I think this is something that we we value very highly of providing these networks for the students. So if you're interested in this space. Uh, or 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 in, a, in an organization that we are working together either as a through a project or either through a placement, we are very happy to to not only just sort of provide these contacts and networks, but also if you're interested in in, in working in that, in them, we we are very very keen to support. So there is a quite a lot of students actually have been going on to work in those organizations. Like there's in in Sweden in Minova, there's one of our students coming on to work. OECD, OPSI, there's people who have gone on to work. And so there's, I think this can be a really valuable opportunity for um, uh, looking around uh, in terms of your career or thinking I'll put in like a couple of years stint at an international organization and then maybe go back. So I think that's that's provided val very valuable uh, opportunity. And of course, also for international students who are here on the visa because they can stay here, I think, for two years. Uh, and work uh, in in the UK, which I think uh, quite a number of students actually take advantage of, and uh, and I think this is one of the one of the smart things that the UK government is providing uh, students with is to to stay stay here and work either at local councils or 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 wherever you think is interesting, and I think that of course helps us with the alumni community because we have a number of students, even international students, uh, staying in London for a couple of years, and that's of course um, uh, really nice. Um, do, I don't think we have any more questions. So I think these are wonderful questions all around. We will post a recording on our website. And again, I think there are um, contact information is on our website. If you have any further questions to either faculty or uh, somebody from admissions um, uh, office or uh, students, former and current, we are, we are very happy to, there is one more Q and A. Uh, yes, about whether the MPA is a good choice. Um, yeah, so that's the, um, so even among our current PhD students, there is three maybe former MPA students. So um, I just was thinking because I, I talked to one of them today, for instance. So yes, this is definitely an option. And we, hence we also, uh, one of the reasons we have a thesis option is particularly for students who might be interested in more either analytical work, developing their analytical skills, or they're actually interested in using the thesis as a, as a kind of like a stepping stone um, to their um, uh, PhD work. And some of these, some of their uh, MPA thesis actually we have published on our uh, in our working paper series. So if you look at um, my paper with Julie McLaurin, for instance, she was an MPA student, and this is um, became a full uh, academic research paper. So this is also something that uh, you know we as academic department are of course always very keen to. To also encourage students who want to go on for PhD and uh, do that, which is which is really nice. Uh, so PhD positions are not really limited, actually. Um, um, PhD, well, the only limit is uh, is availability of supervis supervisors, actually. So so we have a um, in terms of like PhD, there's lots and lots of interest. Um, we accept um, maybe around five students per year can vary from three to three to six, so and so. But at the same time, I think we get easily more than 100, 150 interested people in our PhD. So we are, and it's not about being very selective in terms of, oh my God, we are selecting, but it's actually really having this match between what you want to do in your PhD and what we can supervise. So it's much more about that. So don't be discouraged if you say that, you know, we can't really supervise you because it's much more about what we can, you know, 
be a, a really good supervisor for you because PhD is a, is a very challenging and a very lonely <laughs> endeavor. So you really need good supervisors. You need good good company to make it happen. So we we want to be really really um, sure that uh, that um, fit with what you want to do and researching the PhD and what we can supervise is a good match. But if you look at on our web, BHC website, because some of you might already have a uh, master's degree, you can look. There is a easy way to get in touch because um, there is a, a forum for or a link to expressions of interest. So before you apply full time for a PhD, you can just fill out that form, which is much much easier than uh, doing the full time application because you know full time application you need like references, all of those things. But if you just fill out the form of uh, uh, expression of interest, we can we will get back to you typically. Within, within four weeks, um, whether this is interesting, maybe we want to have a like, conversation with you and, and, and go on from there. So I hope that answered your question, Nina. Okay, thank you, Nina. Uh, yeah, if a, yes, so even if you don't have significant experience, what we then want to see in your in your application are actually two things and um, that you can show that you that you have done something interesting in your life as, a, as an undergraduate student so you have uh, you know you, you have been uh, leading like student society or or you have a i don't know managed a, a trauma group or, or or run a startup company or whatever that might be i mean there might be all kinds of interesting things but also your personal statement you have to then justify really well why you would still make like a, a strong um, a member of this cohort where you have people with different backgrounds, different experiences. So then all of it, uh, all of uh, or predominantly your, your, your personal statement has to do the work for you. So you can't as much rely on CV and experience, but you have to show in your personal statements. And as David said, we, we, we do that, uh, but this is quite exceptional uh, in our case, but still to apply and, uh, and or if, if you want to, have a bit more conversation, get in touch. I'm happy to talk to you about it and um, and um, yeah, give you some feedback. So thank you very much for this uh, active session and, and thank you Wallace and Anjum uh, for uh, for participating here and, and Dana and, uh, and Sonia for preparing this wonderful uh, session from the faculty side and David, thank you. And exactly on time, so you see how good we are in managing things, <laughs> we are finishing. It is a master's in public administration after all. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. And have, have a good day. Thank you. And Thank hope you. to see you in October. Thanks. Bye. Bye.